Hey, hey, what's up? This is your man, DJ Vince Adams. I'm super excited to have everybody back for what is now the second episode of the Voices of House Music. Much love and enough respect to my big brother, the one and only Steve Silk Hurley, who was the inaugural guest. He did his thing last week, but I'm absolutely excited to have another one of my big brothers in the game join me today. So this is Voices of House Music. We bring the pioneers, the legends, the icons, the DJs, producers, the tastemakers of house music right here for you to not only learn the history of house, but at the same time, understand how it's still thriving and how it's still progressing through the culture right now. And we've got some huge, absolutely huge announcements coming very soon about the show. So for anyone who might have missed Steve's episode, it's up on YouTube right now. If you go and put in DJ Vince Adams, Voices of House Music, you'll see a trailer for this show as well. You'll see the first episode, my man Steve Hurley, but we need to put this next one in the can right away. And that means I'm bringing on my second guest, my big brother, the one and only DJ Alan King. So a lot of us have heard about the Chicago House Music Picnic. Well, it's not just the Chicago House Music Picnic. It is the chosen few DJs House Music Picnic, and Alan is one of the members of the Cho Chosen Fruit Q crew. And the cool thing about that is that these cats have been around since the inception of house music and all have their own individual parts in terms of how they came together and what they did individually to now come, to be, to come together to be this chosen few crew. So with that being said, let me bring my big brother, the one and only DJ Alan King to the front right now. AK, as I call him. How's it going, man? B.A. B.A. What's going on, brother? Super happy to have you here. So here's one of the things I wanted to get your re reaction on and wanted you to on camera so I can say this now. Every oh, yeah, huh? oh, man, we're not wasting any time. We're going straight in. And the fun thing about this show is it doesn't start from when it starts to a certain time, man. We are open format right here. So I'm excited to have you here and just let it flow. So check this out. Every family, every huge family has that big brother that when, hey, you heard what Chuck said, like when that big brother says something, everybody listens. And in the house community, in the Chicago DJ community, in the international DJ community, it's like Alan King is the EF Hutton of DJs. Like when Alan talks, everybody's like, hey, you heard what Alan said, right? And that is an absolutely incredible distinction because your byline is that you're a DJ at night, but you're actually a lawyer by day. So we're going to go ahead and get into all of these things. How did you become a superstar house DJ, but at the same time have a thriving career? You're philanthropic. You're doing things in the community. We want to uncover all of that. But without further delay, man, Alan, you're like Terminator X of house. Like nobody knows your voice because you speak with your hands. Let everybody know you got a voice out there, brother. I was just about to say thank you for that compliment. And it's probably why people... Are, are stop and listen because I talk so rare. Right, right. Uh, not like some of my chosen few brothers. Hey, not like DJ Vince Adams. Adams. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, man. We came here to have a good time. So I opened this show last week and I said I wanted to play, pay homage to a movie that we've all seen about hip hop. But I wanted to take that theme and just bring it here and say, Alan King, when did you fall in love with house music? You know, it's a difficult question to answer, and I always bring this up because it's the same reason that it's difficult sometimes to have conversations about house music because two people can be doing that and they can be talking about two entirely different things. Um, so I might as well just get into this now. I mean, the way I always describe it, house music as a phrase and as a concept and a culture before there was an actual genre of music known as house music. So I first started hearing the phrase house and house music, uh, like a lot, a lot of other people in connection with, with the warehouse and, and Frankie Knuckles. Um, you know, there's a million different variations on this story. Um, but um, to me, you know, that's part of house music. Now, somebody else may say, you know, that was disco and house music wasn't created until the 1980s um, when Jesse Saunders arguably um, pressed and released the first house music record on and on, which created a genre, a musical genre of house music. But to me, the, the concept of house, um, the culture of house started long before that and had you know a big part of its roots in the warehouse. So um, neither of which really answers your question, but I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I became a DJ in 1977 
and we can get into all this, but, but you know, came, became associated with the Chosen a few later. And so we, we were fairly big DJs on the scene and doing our thing before I ever heard Frankie play. I mean, I didn't go to the warehouse until I was legally supposed to be in the warehouse. <laughs> it was April of 1981 uh, when I turned 18. But um, once I went, uh, unlike, you know, most people who tell the lie that when they were eight years old, they snuck in. <laughs> They were carrying. Right. They were carrying Ron's crates when they were eight. Right, years. right. right. They were carrying Ron's and Frankie's crates. Right, right. And that whole thing. Um, so you know, you know, a lot of people have said, and I take it as a huge compliment that, that Frankie's a big influence on me, and, and he, he was. Um, but I had been DJ for many years and had been a fairly popular DJ before I ever actually heard Frankie Knuckles play record. Um, but but the point is, once I went to the warehouse. It was like nothing I had ever experienced before. I mean, I, I learned like what a what a club, a real club, was supposed to look like, what a party was supposed to sound like and, and feel like, and how a DJ was supposed to sort of you know conduct the evening um, throughout the night. So it c- comes around to say that on that broader definition of house music. I was already in love with the music, but I really fell in love with it when I started going to the warehouse in 1981. So that means that you were actually a music lover that led you into becoming a DJ and then house music uh, infused in 1981. So let's nerd out a, a little bit on this because since you got started in the 70s, and we've got a lot of DJs who watch the show and a lot of people who are music enthusiasts who would like to know more about what goes on behind the scenes, you actually seem to prefer rotary mixers as opposed to your traditional fade sliders. Kind of walk us through your progression and what equipment you started with in the 70s and how it kind of grew and you know now you're, you're the master of the rotary. Yeah, well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> it, it, it's a more recent thing that I've come around to the rotary. So I, I started on the uh, you know regular slide mixers. Was it the realistic uh, the uh, the, uh, the Radio Shack? It's probably the, it's probably the Teledyne from Radio Shack. Right, right, right. My, my my first one. Uh, I think I got about seventy seven or seventy eight. Um, but you know, in the early days of the Chosen Few, we had a, a mixer. The brand was called Clubman. It's called the Clubman One One. And really simple two-channel mixer with crossfade, and so we, you know, we all grew up on 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 the slide mixers and the crossfade mixers. Right. You know, we, we were never doing the, you know, uh, Jazzy Jeff, you know, Vince <laughs> Adams tricks. <laughs> but uh, uh, nonetheless, so so that was really my history, and I and I would say it's in more recent years when I've kind of, you know, come back to DJing, you know, more quote unquote full time and we can talk about that but um, but once I had some experience playing on, on rotary mixers um, I, I, I think it allows you the way I play which is really blending songs and, and long blends I, I think a rotary has a has a larger sort of trajectory to, to bring a record in and you, you can be more subtle in you know how you are aligning the, the the sound of the two records a lot you know a lot of slide mixers pioneer or whatever you know you you move it an inch and, and you're, you're you're hearing right. um you know the, the other thing right away so i i'm a believer in it it, it allows you to have a, a better range of bringing in a song and taking another song out now the hard parts are you know it's difficult to sometimes we want to slam that record in <laughs> And we, we just, <laughs> you know, right, so you got to right. handle both rotaries. Right, right. And, you know, for some people, um, you know, playing, you know, old disco records, which, as, you know, most people know, but don't really think about, um, it's a lot harder mixing those records and right. blending those records for the simple reason of the fact that most of them were live human beings playing bass or playing bass. And unlike electronic music today, which, is consistent, you know, a live human being is not going to be consistent in the way they play drums. So, you know, a lot of that um, gets deep into the sort of the skill of at least those of us that were playing records back in those days or are interested now in 
sort of the old disco music. So right. it can be, there, there's some advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've told people that I don't like rain mixers at all. And they're like, why don't you like rain? You can just plug your Serato right into the back. I say, there's no graduation. It's like you're going from zero to 1.5 yeah. or zero to 2.5. And there's that I need that graduation from 2.5 to 1.51 all the way, you know, smoothly to zero, which mm -hmm. I, I certainly prefer the Pioneer mixes for, but, you know, being, you know, on the pure side for what you and Terry are doing, again, just a little bit on that end, tell us about the brand that you're using right now, because a lot of people are looking at your lives, and they're like, I haven't seen that mixer before, <laughs> and, you know, I know Terry is introducing you guys to a yeah. lot of stuff, so. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's funny. And that's you, Terry Hunter, just so, they're like, who's this Terry guy? Terry Hunter, his, his chosen few brother. Right, right, and, and, and Terry, I I think Terry did introduce me to this mixer, but but certainly was a big influence on the Rotary uh, deal. It's funny that you say that about my lies because you know I, I'm doing my thing. I don't necessarily read all the comments, but I, I read one last Saturday night or the weekend before, um, and somebody was like, like, man, I, I really dig that old grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> And what I wanted to say was, uh, no, young fella. This is the new, new. This is a brand new right. top of the line mixer. It's, it's, right. it's not a grandpa mixer. Right. Uh, but I'm using now the, the Bozak AR4, um, which is sort of a, a tabletop Bozak mixer. And uh, um, it's it's just my favorite. I've played on lots of them and, and for reasons I, I talked about and just kind of the warmth of the sound and um, so I'm really into the Bozak right now. I've got a couple other rotaries that I'm like need to get off my butt and actually sell probably because gotcha. I'll never use them again. But, Fair enough. So the Bozak is, is is a great brand, but um, you know there are others out there. And, and there are a lot of people who can't necessarily relate to the equipment, but they can relate to the sound, the music. So, you know, what is it that got you into, like, you know, I want to put my hands on the tables, manipulate the, the music. What were you listening to if you started DJing in, in 77? What were your earlier influences, let's say, from 67 to 77 that led to uh, you becoming a DJ? Um, that's a great question. I, uh, you, you know, one of the things was um, I was a huge Beatles fan when I was a real, real shorty. So I had an older sister who was like 11 years older. So uh, when she was in high school, she was, it's like when the Beatle craze had hit. And I, and I was younger, but um, she used to always tell the story that, that like she hated that I would always come into her bedroom and mess around with her records and, and try to find the Beatles records. So I guess it apparently got so bad that she had a lock, like a little chain lock put on the door um, up high enough that I couldn't reach it. Okay. Uh, but but in but being the, you know, little brother with the ingenuity that I was, I, I found a, a broomstick, a broom <laughs> handle, and was able to unlatch the, the the latch on the door and I would go in there and play Beatles records. So so from a very young age I was I was determined uh, about music. I have an older brother who was, you know, really into the, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, you know your R&B stuff, which I, which I was as well. So um, he was a big influence as well. Um, and, and I say I started in 77, the, the first time I did anything that somebody might confuse as being a DJ was actually <laughs> my eighth grade graduation, oh, wow. party, which was in 1977. So I had this big party at my house and I figured, you know, I'm going to to play the records for the party and it was you know a great turnout with tons of kids i'm sure my parents like you know were still pissed about that a long time <laughs> later but so i played music that night and i didn't have two turntables uh, or a mixer i think i had one turntable i'm using all my dad's stuff and, uh, and a cassette deck and so it was my first experience with you know putting on a record and seeing people react to it and you know, and then I'm thinking like, man, if they like that record, wait until they hear this next one. So it, it, it was that experience that, I, you know, hooked me. And, you know, it's literally, I don't know, almost 50 years later. Wow. And, I, and, I, and, and I'm still hooked uh, by that feeling of, of choosing music and playing music that has an impact on people and <clears throat> making them dance. So. After the eighth, eighth grade thing, I started doing research and figuring out like, okay, 
what is a DJ and what do you need? You know, what are the tools that you need? So I, I dragged my old man out to, I still remember, it was Pacific Stereo on Belmont and Broadway. Wow. This is 1977 or 78 and convinced him why I needed a, not only a one turntable where you could adjust the speed, but I needed two of them, which he could not understand for the life of him. Um, so I started putting, uh, you know, some equipment together and, and, you know, there was this transition period where I'm, you know, I got some turntables, but I'm still using my dad's speakers until I blew them out at, 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 at a party somewhere. But, uh, so, you know, by 78, 79, I, I kind of had all the tools of the trade and I was doing a lot of, you know, house parties, meaning parties in people's houses, right. but, you know, big parties in, you know, whether it was Hyde Park or Jackson Park Highlands or, or Peel Hill or wherever it was, a lot of basement parties and you know, backyard parties. And uh, Wayne Williams and Jesse Saunders were, I'm getting kind of far afield of your question. No, that's all good. Um, you know, Wayne and Jesse were popular DJs at the same time. So, you know, I, I, I kind of looked up to them as they were doing their thing, but I was kind of doing my thing. Um, so, you know, I don't know if I'd say we were rival DJs for a while, but we were both sort of in the same scene, right. kind of doing our thing. And then, you know, 1980 or so, um, you know, we kind of came together and... and, and Big Daddy Wayne asked me to join the crew. So. The, the founder, the, the godfather. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, here's one, one thing that I, I wanted to throw at you. We were having a little fun in pre-production about the shirt. And I said I wore this shirt. <laughs> my, my shirt, yeah, I said I wore this shirt in honor of you. And, and you, t you, you talked about the formatting of a party back in, you know, the, the late 70s, the 80s, those warehouse days. And, you know, of course... I was around during a lot of the Hot Mix 5. I wasn't old enough to be in the clubs, but that was more my introduction. Uh, my big brother, Jerry McAllister, and, you know, getting into more of my story later, um, I, I, I went to uh, grammar school with Jerry's entire siblings. So he was the old one with the crate, and I would be over at his house just like, can I play on this turntable? And he's like, man, just don't break anything. And so the irony is that my first turntables were for my eighth grade graduation. So we've got that okay. in yep. common. But getting back to the shirt and the warehouse, what I wanted to say was I've been able to see this arc from the 80s all the way now to current. And the club environment has changed quite a bit. Me being a cross genre DJ and you being a purist on the house side, we still see some similar things in terms of the club is not exactly the way it, it is today as it was even in 2005, as it was in 95, as it was in 85 and, and, and 81. Do me a favor, kind of walk us through, because I think it's important for the patron, the attendee, the people that are at the party to get a view of what the dance floor, what the environment looks like from a DJ's perspective, where we used to have people run up to us and say, oh, my God, what's that song? As opposed to when are you going to play this song or the selfies and the cameras and the, I dance for two minutes and then I stop where you used to have people that walked in the door, dance for seven hours and then walked out the door and the dance floor never cleared the entire time. Kind of give us a little trajectory of the, the, the club yeah. over this time. And, no, that, that's a great point. And I, I think a lot of it, you know, depends on where you are, um, you know, even even currently. You know, you, you know, in an underground, strictly house club, you know, in a smoky basement is going to have a different dynamic like that than, you know, a more mainstream party where you're playing hip hop and house and, you know, everything in between. Um, but I kind of came up at a time and, and, and just to use Frankie as an example, I mean, he would play roughly from midnight until noonish the next day. 12 hours, uh, uh, just so everybody hours. gets that, 12 hours set. 12 hours, all all, um, all night. And you talk about never hearing my voice. <laughs> you, you would never once hear Frankie Knuckles on the mic or you know, no one would deign to, to come up and, and, and suggest that, that he should play this or not play that. Um, so I kind of grew up in that environment a at the same time I, you know, it, the shirt is funny because I, I've made some comments about requests and, and, and whether I care or not that it's your birthday or your girl's birthday. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I get it because, you know, part of this is, is, 
you know, it, it's entertainment. It's right. not just being a DJ. It's not just playing records. Although I, I have sort of adopted a persona where I'm going to do my best to let my music speak for itself. And, and, and you know, that works for me. Um, there are other people even in our own crew. You know, Wayne's going to be on the mic. Mike Dunn's going to be on the mic. You know, Terry's cool being on the mic. You know, he can have it either way. Um, so we get that, you know, and I, I, I can do that. But um, the, the flip side of it that the audience needs to understand is it, it's also us at work doing our jobs. And I, and I think club goers, number one, don't have a, an appreciation for the attention that it takes and the skill that it takes and it's not even when you're when you're mixing records and you got to concentrate if you're doing the job right your your mind is working <clears throat> constantly you're thinking about okay i'm looking at this floor you're thinking about the next record you're thinking about three records from now i'm gonna start to take them down four records from now i'm you know there's a lot going on up there so people have no problem bum rushing the booth. Here, take my coat. Can I keep my coat up here? It's Shay Shay's birthday. Can you announce it's Shay Shay's birthday? So I get it. I get it. And all of that is, is part of the entertainment vehicle. But the, the flip side of it is, it's like me going down to their job and their their you know a a and. Uh, a, a, a writer and you know I just go down to their job and stand over their cubicle and go hmm, you really gonna like that <laughs> I mean so it, 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 in that respect we're trying to do our jobs and it's not an ego thing we're trying to do our job to give them the best party experience that we can give them so again it's it's environmental I mean you know Vince Adams is gonna be on the, on the mic that's Vince Adams. That's perfect. I mean, that, that, that works for you. That's what your crowd loves. You're shouting them out. People like to be shouted out. If I glance at this iPad next to me right now, I start shouting out some people. <laughs> and I get that. And people enjoy that. So I'm, I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of dynamics going on. And I guess on the, the subject, if I could have party goers take away one thing, is just the appreciation that we're just not up there bullshit. You know, we're not just kind of up there, you know, want to have conversations about unrelated subjects and, and our attention distracted. We're, we're trying to do our job and we're trying to do it to, to, to make the party the best that we can possibly make. I think that you, you hit on something when you talked about just the, the way that records were made more so in the, the 80s, uh, 70s, especially in the 70s, where nothing was quantized. And yeah. so for those who don't know, quantized means that there's a perfect beat. So if you ever go to Vegas, you'll never hear a song that's offbeat because it's all bap, 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 bap. Sounds like the same beat has been playing for two hours, and it's because it has. Every song has the same beat. Where Except, except they get a half a million dollars for doing it. Fair, fair, fair enough, fair enough. And, and so that amount of concentration, I think, has crafted a different seriousness in those DJs who were born before 19, let's say, 83, because there are a lot of people born around 77, you know, 83, who are really, you know, keepers of the gate, if you will. But having that level of seriousness is a, a factor of the fact that we used to have to concentrate for virtually every song. I mean, if you think about just the first way that Capricorn I need love do, 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 do. like it was like you had to bring that in super clean on Martin Circus the do, 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 do. like everything had its place and you had to concentrate through those flows and of course it became second nature but it wasn't like you know birthday shout outs and those things so I think that really has changed the DJs today who can do those things quite easily because they didn't have that that background of coming from a music that wasn't quantized, you know. Uh, so I, I just kind of wanted to, to piggyback off of that yeah, to say you know, I, I certainly feel I, I, I agree with that 100%. And, and, and at the same time, you know, it it, it, it it did take more attention and more skill. And I would I would say there, there are a lot of DJs or younger DJs out there now that kind of poo-poo the old school and the classics. And, I, you know, I, I, I'm up to date on the most current music and I, as I've always been my whole career but I think you know there's a lot of folks that are playing now that just never had the experience playing that kind of music or 
you know, just having practiced it enough to, to be able to do it. So <clears throat> what you get instead is sort of like, you know, you people over here are just stuck in the past and, right. you know, we're moving on. And when the reality is that I think all DJs should be playing good music, whether it's from 2020 or 1979. Absolutely. Um, so, um, you know, it would behoove some folks to spend some time getting acquainted with older music and how to play it. Now, let's touch on the mid-80s just for a second about some of the legendary clubs out of the Chicago house scene. You've touched a lot of these places. I mean, the Blue Gargoyle, I don't want to go through the names. I mean, you really crafted a quite a resume, uh, you know, around the city for where you were able to, to put your touch. Kind of take us back to the club and throw some of those names at us so the people from back in that day could say, oh, those are the days, and that's the way it used to go down in Sawyer's, and, you know, let, 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 us, let us get a feel for that uh, during that time, and then incorporate how you, Jesse, and, and then Wayne decided, hey, I think we should collaborate, and, uh, you know, you became actually a member of the Chosen Few during that era. Yeah. So, so Wayne was the founder, is the founder, and, and ultimately has always been the one who's, who's chosen, you know, new members, new chosen members. Uh, although we all collaborate about those things when they when they rarely happen these days. Um, but uh, so by I would say by 1981, um, the, the crew was. Uh, Wayne and Jesse and myself and, and Tony Hatchett and I'll, I'll leave Andre Hatchett out for a moment because um, there's a story I'll get to there but so by those early 80s, 81, 80, 81 um, you know Wayne had been doing a lot of big parties um, not necessarily Mendel but, but other things and anyway by the time the four of us came together as a crew um, you know we were just had it blown up. I mean, we'd gotten hot in the underground, and you know, this is before there's Hot Mix Five. This is before, you know, there's really anything on the radio. So, you know, we're talking about the loft at, at 14th and Michigan, um, Sours or Sawyers, depending on your right. <laughs> uh First impressions, um, a Tree of Life <clears throat> was another spot out at 95th Street. Uh, Blue Gargoyle and Hyde Park. So there were, there were a lot of these different spots where where things were happening and were kind of like the, the place. You know, it might have been the place for a couple weekends and then it was <laughs> the new place. Right. Um, but, um, so, you know, we started giving our own parties as the chosen few, but at the same time, there were a lot of groups that were giving parties and they were hiring us. So, um, like Vertigo was one group, which was, was Craig Loftus and, and Lori Branch. Um, it was a group of girls called the Young Coteries and Coteries. So there were all these groups that were giving parties every weekend and, you know, they would hire us or we'd be doing our own, own parties. So, um, you know, I'm sure <clears throat> there were things going on in other parts of the city. And, you know, I hear things that, you know, Little Lewis was rocking the West Side at the same time, but we were kind of in our, our world kind of mostly on the south side, but some north side things too. So for, you know, that period of time in the early 80s, um, you know, we, we were kind of riding high on this thing. And what I would, I guess what I say that the, probably the biggest contribution that we made during that era in terms of the chosen few is that we, and we, we weren't copying it because a lot of us had not been there yet. But we were taking the formula of what was happening at the warehouse, for example, which was a largely gay um, club, um, which was cool. And a lot of us obviously had no, no problem with that and went there um, religiously. But we were taking that vibe and introducing it to the young, straight high school kids um, in Chicago. So that So a lot of people our generation and roughly our generation will say, I first heard this music at the loft or I, you know, Steve Hurley or Chip E will both tell you that they, they were both introduced it to this walking into the loft with the chosen few playing in the early 80s. So um, we were all over. We were still doing those backyard parties. We were basement parties. We were, you know, at, at all these places. Um, so it was it was a magical time. So you know we were playing 
if not all the way to 12 noon, at least until the morning. So it was, it was an all night kind of thing. And then when we got old enough, you know, we'd leave our party and we'd go to the warehouse for the rest of the, you know, morning to, the, to noon. Um, so, you know, it was a crazy time. And, and, and like my parents it initially weren't crazy with the idea of <laughs> leaving the house at midnight right. and coming in at, you know, 10 or 11 the next morning. Right. But, you know, I'm, I'm 15 or 16 years old and I come in in the morning and I got three or four hundred dollars cash <laughs> uh, from working that night. And they start to go, hmm, well, OK, OK, well, you know, you, 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 you're, you're earning some money. You're not doing anything you know, illicit or illegal that they were aware of. <laughs> so, you know, it was it was kind of a, an in-between time. You know, there had been uh, WDAI, Disco DAI on radio in the, right. in the late 70s. And then, um, you know, Frankie opened the warehouse in 77 or Robert did. And um, so that was going on. And then the Hot Mix 5 came a little bit later, which was a, a big explosion for a lot of people. And right. I, I understand and respect that a lot of people jumped on the train when it, you know, when it hit mainstream radio. But in the interim there, there was this kind of thriving underground scene and we were a big part of that. So I, I think this will be a little fun. We've got people that are listening in right now who are listening live or those who listen to a replay. And we've got probably three different sets of people. One, they're totally unfamiliar with House. Two, they may be more on that later period, 86, 87, or then those who live the moment and they want to relive. Can you do us a favor and throw us like three or four of the staple songs from maybe a loft set or maybe from a, a warehouse set that if a person wanted to kind of dig on YouTube yeah. or, or, yeah. or go, go to their Spotify and pull up these songs, like what are like some of those staple songs that kind of like symbolize that era? Yeah, no, that, 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 that's good. I mean, a lot of the, the Teddy Pendergrass stuff that people are still playing, you know, whether it's Bad Luck or Love I Lost, I mean, those were were big records at the warehouse. Um, you know, Lolita Holloway, uh, whether, you know, Love Sensation or, or Hit and Run. And, and Lolita Holloway is a great example of what I talked about. There's sort of like two definitions of, of house music because some people would say, you know, nothing that Lolita Holloway sang was house music. It, it was disco, it was pre-house. And then the other side of the street will, will say, she was the queen of house. Yeah, that was the foundation. That was the roots, right. Absolutely. Right, right. So, in, in, in their view, right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So the loft, you know, I would say, like, big records were um, all over the place, like Change, Glow of Love, uh, Paul Lewis, Girl, You Need a Change of Mind. Uh, now, since, 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 since you mentioned that, what, what to yeah. you is the difference between the Eddie Kendricks and, and the Paul version of Change of Mind. What 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 would make you play one versus the other? You know, they're they're, they're both fire for sure. And uh, that that version by Paul Lewis is one of the rare sort of cover um, takes on a record that I that I, I like really really like. It's got some run to it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. for the dance floor for sure. So you know, we 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 got into that big time. You know, then the Sing 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 Charlie Kaleo Orchestra. Martin Circus and uh, you know Dan Hartman, you light my fire, you know that kind of stuff. Um, so that you know that was all sort of warehouse slash loft era stuff. Um, I think when the Hot Mix Five hit, they were playing some of that, but they were playing. Mm, I don't want to say more commercial because I don't want to disparage it in any way. No, I mean, I it, if it's a, no, ABC, Look of Love, and, you know... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, it was a little more mainstream right. and a little more commercial, yeah. um, which, which which was cool. Um, and as I say, I mean, I, I, I love those guys, and they're, they're all friends, and, and they had a humongous impact on this music mm -hmm. kind of spreading, but... Um, but yeah, yeah, the, the kind of things that you were just talking about. And, the, and then, you know, when the real house genre records from Jesse and Steve Hurley and Farley and, and Jamie, um, although Jamie's an interesting topic because Jamie had music long before anybody. He just hadn't, like, pressed it on a record. Right. And, and, and It's like Frankie Knuckles presents, <laughs> but it, it, was, it was there for a while, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean whether it's your love or... Waiting on my angel, or 
I mean, that stuff was floating around on cassette tapes forever. Right. Before, you know, the mainstream had ever heard it or, or, or could buy it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it, it, it was all, whether it was danceable R&B or disco or house, um, you know, it, it was all in that family of, of, of dance music. Um, what, what I would consider in most cases soulful dance music. Gotcha. Um, as opposed to what you might hear in Vegas today, as you said. Right, right. Um, <laughs> that's another topic. So, so here's the deal. We've got people, I'm sure, on pins and needles, and I want them to know that Alan and I, we cannot see anything that's happening in the chat. We make this 100% between him uh, and myself so that we can give each other our full and undivided attention. But everybody loves the house picnic. And I'm sure they're on pins and needles, but we're going to make them wait just a little bit more because you and I are kindred spirits. And, and I say that, that there aren't too many DJs who can DJ full time with two degrees. So my undergrad is in business. My master's is in computer science. And you have two degrees yeah. as, as well. So let's talk quickly because this is about your story as well. Uh, you messed around and grew up on us and decided, hey, I'm going to go to college and one thing yeah. left to the next. So so how did that departure from the club scene go into academia and starting your own law practice yeah. and that sort of thing? Uh, you know, I'm glad you asked me that because I, I, I haven't talked about it publicly a lot. And and I, I left for college in, in 81 and um, law school in 85 and then started my law practice in 88. So when I went away to school in 81, and I wasn't far, I was in the state, um, but that was when sort of, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, my friends like Jesse and Steve and, and Farley and all these folks are starting to make their own records. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I had been in that scene and a popular DJ and then I go out to college and I'm like, what the, how are they, what do, you mean, what do you mean they have a record, what do you mean you have a record out? So there was some of that, you know, so I'm, I'm down in, in uh, later on in, in, in uh, well, yeah, I guess college years then, so I'm down in school, like, you know, laboring over my books at two o'clock in the morning, and Jesse's telling me he's on his way to Europe for you know, his, new, his new single, and, I, and so I was, I was hating a little bit for a while. Uh, no doubt that those guys were starting to do things. And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of missed that part of it. Um, so, you know, there's part of me that for a quick second would say, you know, I wish I had gone in a more musical direction. But, you know, the reality is I, if I don't go that direction, I went in. <clears throat> I don't go to law school where I met my wife. I don't meet my wife. I don't have my girls, so it's like it only takes a nanosecond for me to realize that Fair enough. everything happens for a reason, and I did the right things. Um, but during all that time, so when I went to college, I continued to DJ. I was kind of a big DJ on campus at, at Augustana, a small school. But um, and then law school, I did a little bit. I always had my setup in my apartment in law school, so I was still doing it. But you know, I wasn't doing a lot of parties, and then. When I started at the firm, I, you know, I, I more or less gave it up because, you know, it was demanding, and you know, I had concerns about how my colleagues might think about it Absolutely. and view it, and, and clients, quite frankly. And that's one of the things I regret that I, I kind of buried it for, or tried to bury it for a long time, even when I kind of came back to more active DJing, and, and eventually. You know, the internet just sort of outed me. And, you know, people, people, like, hey, it, like, there's, a, there, there's the club picture, and there's right, the. Right. <laughs> so now, if you Google me, it's probably gonna be like 70% music stuff comes up, and right. 30% law. Uh, but the, the, the reality is, during this whole period, uh, and I'm off in school and practicing law, I never lost my, my love for the music, and, and I stayed on top of the music. So, you know, a lot of that was, you know, Wayne keeping me abreast or, you know, checking out Andre when I'm in town for a weekend or... or and, and where did you attend law school? Uh, University of Illinois in Champaign. Okay, so you were down the street and around the corner. You are still getting energy. Yeah, I was. So, in fact, as I said, I, I, I started going to the warehouse in April of 81, and it wasn't long after that that I had left for school. 
But I was coming home almost every weekend, almost every Saturday to go to the warehouse. And, and half the time, my parents didn't even know I was in town. I would drive in, I'd go to the warehouse, I'd stumble out of the warehouse Sunday morning and drive right back to school. Wow. Um, but I, I stayed close to the music and, you know, I mean, once you're a DJ, you, you can't quit that. You, you, you know, you can suspend it, you, you can pause it. Uh, uh, when the music is really part of the essence of who you are in your life, you know, it's just, it was just a matter of time before I felt, you know, secure enough and comfortable enough and confident enough that, okay, I, I'm building a little success in this career here so I can kind of go back to my first love. Yeah, I, I call it that pookie moment in uh, New Jack City. Wait, it'd be calling me, man. It'd be calling me. <laughs> so, you know, when I, I think I told uh, Steve last week, when I graduated from college, I threw away a turntable. I left my records at the frat house. I was like, that was nice. Now on to this corporate right. thing. And next thing I know, three years later, it's like, you know, yeah. back at it. And, and that's a real good time because I started DJing on the Chicago scene. Uh, I started in the 80s, but on the Chicago uh, platform in 96. And that's the first year, or 95 is the first year, I think, that I can remember walking from the Highlands. I mean, uh, yeah, walking from the Jackson Park area across 67th Street to this thing. They, like, they're doing house music on, on the lakefront, like 95, 96. That was like my first time around there. So this is the 30th anniversary of the Chosen Few. Um Picnic and the Chosen Few Picnic, for those who don't know, is literally the world's premier true house picnic. And we, we can say true house picnic because the festivals and the EDM things, that's that's very commercial. We're talking about things that celebrate and honor the roots and the fabric of house music. That is known as the Chosen Few DJ's house picnic that typically takes place around the 4th of July every year. And it's happened now for 30 years. We'll talk about how we're going to do something a little different or how we mean the community. We're going to do something different. But I want your impression of the picnic when you weren't really in that core DJ faction anymore, you know, th through those those uh, attorney years and those practice years, talk to us about attending more so as an attendee and what that looked like and kind of like what happened on the monsoon year, like how did it, you know, kind of expand and, and become what it is today? Yeah, so, I, and I was never actually just an attendee, so I, I should have said, the, 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 even when I had more or less stopped. Well, you've always been a member. Yeah. I, I mean, no, yeah, yeah. But, but, the one, but the one time a year I would play would be the picnic. Fair enough. Fair the picnic enough. started in ninety, so so I, I would I would always play them, but um, you know, it's 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 a crazy phenomenon. It, it's it's a social phenomenon. It's you know, we can we can get into all of that. But it, it started with very humble beginnings. I mean they, you know, people who would always ask us, you know, chosen few who used to come to our parties and followed us in the eighties and seventies and you know, when you guys don't play again, you know, you know when you're going to have a party? And so we started one year with, with a party in a, in a club. But in 90, we, we thought, you know, the time that everybody's home is, is 4th of July and let's um, let's have a picnic. And Tony and Andre Hatchett's family had a, a family picnic behind the Museum of Science and Industry every year. So the Chosen Few picnic really started with us blobbing on to the Hatchet family picnic. And, you know, music obviously was always a part of it because that, that was the essence of what we did. But for the early years, it was a, a, a background part of it. I mean, we literally would roll two garbage cans together, lay some plywood across the garbage cans and set up our turntables. And, and you know, so we'd all DJ and, and that was cool. But at the same time, you know, we're throwing the football around, we're, we're playing softball, we're, uh, you know, the kids are climbing trees, and, you know, it, it was your normal family picnic, and uh, and music was in the background. And, you know, I'd say that first year, you know, maybe 40 or 50 people came out there through the course of the day, through word of mouth, and it was fun, and everybody had a great time. It was like, you guys should do this again, and we had no plans to do it again. And, you know, we, we just continued to come out every 4th of July. And, 
50 people became 100, and 100 became 1,000, and 1,000 became 5,000, which became 15,000. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of change from there to here. Um, but that's really all it was. I mean, we, we never set out. We never set out to have a, a huge event. We never set out to have a music festival. We never set out to have an annual anything. You know, it just kind of took the course of its own and, and, and was very organic in that regard. And, and I'm just glad that when it got so large that, that we kind of stepped up and, and met the moment because a lot of us were funding it, you know, out of our pockets um, from the beginning. And, you know, with 50 people, that's cool. We can, we can make that work. <laughs> and, you know, with, with 100, 150 people, eh, you know. But, you know, I, I look back at those days, we didn't have a permit, we didn't have anything. Um, Tony and I, or Kim and I, would drive down to this little store on 95th Street off Jeffrey where you could rent some tables and we get a couple of tables and then we could bring some chairs out there. And so, you know, we were funding it out of our pockets and, um, you know, eventually it got to a point where, okay, we gotta start passing this bucket around. Um, if we're going to continue to do this, and then it got past the bucket days, uh, and we can get back into sort of the, the cost of it and all that later. But um, um, so you know, it's it's it, it's it's a cultural to me. It, it's a cultural phenomenon that that we don't take you know exclusive credit for. I mean, it, it's bigger than us. It's it's the the people who come that made it. You know, the, the proliferation of the internet obviously, it, you know, made people aware of it around the country and in other countries. And, um, you know, I give credit to, there was a, a, a website back in the, the late 90s and 2000s called Deep House Page. And Deep House Page was a huge, you know, greeting place for, for people in the scene. And so I think Deep House Page had a lot to do with, with, with the picnic blowing up, or at least people becoming aware of it. That's things. fantastic credit. That's, that's yeah, incredible. Other, other cities and, and, and other countries. So, um, quickly, you did mention the monsoon year. So, so you know, we were dealing with this thing. You know, it was it was growing, and um, you know, we started getting uh, a little bit, you know, more of a, a DJ setup and and a little more formal and all that. Anyway, we we, we still didn't know what we had on our hands. Um, or that it was something that was gonna continue or that people cared about it continuing. And in 30 years, we have had amazing luck with weather. Oh, wow, I mean, yeah. It's just been like, it, you know, if you've asked Wayne, Wayne will tell you, no, God has just looked out for us. And I can't argue that point because in 30 years, it has only rained a couple of times. And it's unbelievable. Some years it, it rains all week leading up to the picnic and it rains immediately the week after that. But we've been fortunate, but, but in the early 2000s, it may have been 2003 or earlier, but in the earlier 2000s, one year, it rained so hard. I mean, I can't even describe how hard it rained once we got out there. And, uh, you know, we started to like cover up the speakers and we're packing up and we think it's over. And there's, you know, two or 300 people out there dancing in the rain and nobody left. And it is just pouring. You know, we call it the monsoon year because it just, at that, that was the moment we looked at each other and we're like. This is magic. We got something. Yeah. yeah. There's something, there's something we have here. So the, the other thing that came from that was the next year, everybody brought a tent. <laughs> so, you know, that's so associated with Chosen Few now, but the tent thing wasn't a big thing before the monsoon year. But the next year, everybody was back, and everybody brought their tent uh, because of the monsoon. But my favorite memory of the monsoon is uh, Wayne taking off his shirt and, and running out in the rain. <laughs> uh, but it was a crazy time, and, you know, that's that's when we sort of realized, okay, this is, this is something special. So. So, so let's let's do this. You know, I just ran a little footage, not only from the picnic itself, but there are a lot of satellite events that take place around the picnic. Do us a favor, and, and from the attendees, 
perspective and things that you would like for people to know that go into the actual creation of uh, the picnic. It's not like you guys on, on May 3rd say, hey, I think we're going to do it again this year. Like, you know, let people know everything that's, you know, from their perspective, like the things that you would like for them to, to, to actually be aware of from a planning, a, a preparing, even the artists, uh, you know, the Stephanie Mills, uh, the Monique Binghams, the, uh, you know, you've had, you know, the Tana Gar Gardner's heartbeat, uh, work your body. I mean, you've had some of the staple, um, you know, divas of house music on that stage where people are like, I would never know the person behind that, you know, share, share that context. And I ran that video. I'm going to run it again because... The situation that we're in right now in the world, I'm sure that video for anyone who's ever attended the picnic, it gave him chills like, oh, my God, we're not doing it like that this yeah. year. So let me run that video one more time and, you know, yeah. kind of give us a little behind the scenes peek at what's taking yeah. place. Yeah. And, and I go back to some of the things that go into it. And, and uh, you know, you, you're never going to satisfy everyone and, and people. You know, we do the best that we can, and we, we reinvest whatever little coin we, we, we make. Sometimes we make a little coin, sometimes we don't, but, but it largely gets reinvested in the, in the picnic, um, and it's our goal to, um, you know, just create a great day for the people that come to the picnic, and that's, that's always been our focus, and it continues to be our focus. But in terms of these legendary guest artists, I mean, the the coolest thing of this whole thing that we've become so big and so recognized and, and people want to, DJs want to play the event, performers want to perform at the event. So to be able to, you know, reach out to a Stephanie Mills or a Evelyn Champagne King or, you know, you name it, you know, people we grew up playing their records in the clubs, you know, listening to their records, and actually be able to reach out to those folks and say, hey, have you, have you heard of this little picnic we do in Chicago? <laughs> and, uh, you know, not only to, to be able to access them, but, you know, in 99.9% .9 of cases, they, they are enthusiastic about doing it. And, and beyond that, I mean, to be able to give them an opportunity if, you know, they are largely, you know, past their primes and their careers. And, you know, at this point, to, to put a Tommy Gardner or uh, Linda Clifford on a stage in front of 40,000 people, that ain't happening every day for them right. as, as great an artist as they are. Absolutely. So they appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we've seen people literally in tears crying on that stage, you know, before they perform, after they perform just to have the, the opportunity again to perform in front of an audience like that. So that's, that's, that's probably been the single most fun thing in your life. You know, we sit around and say, you know, who would we love to just put up on the Chosen Few stage? And, you know, who would people just snap if we, if we pulled up? So we sit around and have these conversations and it's like, man, Jocelyn Brown, you got to get Jocelyn Brown. And, and then we go into action and, you know, you, you figure out agents or connections and and next thing you know, you know, Jocelyn Brown's flying in from London and she's doing her thing. So that, that part of it is so much fun. And, and in almost all cases, the, the performers have been and the DJs have been great and humble. Um, we've had some divas over the years and on, on the on the performer side or the DJ side or yeah, both? You know, I'm, I'm not gonna go there. But I'm just saying, hey, it's the voices of the house music, man. We gotta bring it. I'm, I'm gonna say the biggest diva we've ever had performing the chosen few. All I'm gonna say was it was not a woman. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So. So, you know, there's that aspect of it. But yeah, at this point, I mean, when we're talking about an event with 30 or 40,000 people, you know, the, the, the planning, our planning starts almost the day after the event for the for the next year. Wow. You know, usually around the, the first of the year in January, we start having formal meetings with the city. And, and these meetings are crazy because it, it, it's a big, you know, we're not an official city event, but we drain a lot of city resources. So, you know, we have these meetings, it's, it's us, it's the aldermen of off the aldermen, it's the city, 
DKs, it's the park district, it's the police department, it's the fire department, it's um, Museum of Science and Industry, it's Laura Beater Children's Hospital. Right. It, I mean, everybody who can potentially be touched or, or disrupted by that day. And we have regular meetings where we go through everything we're going to do. And, you know, we, we tell the city, you know, can you shut off the traffic at this time from, you know, southbound Lakeshore Drive and CTA, can you bring some cooling buses here? And so there's, you know, it, it, it's, it's like you say, I mean, we just don't roll out of bed and say, you know, <laughs> put this thing on. So it, it, it's a very time consuming, very elaborate um, thing. Um, and then, I don't know if you want to get into expenses and all of that, but but there's, there's I, I I do, and I'm gonna pause. I, I'm gonna pause you all right. on, on that one because that's 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 what they call you know uh, all gravy right there. We we need to say the gravy for 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 the uh, the later part right. of the run. So you know, let, let me ask this: there, there are three different things that have really come out as a result of the the picnic that, that I've seen from my perspective. The first is that there are actually satellite chosen few picnics that are taking place in different metropolitan areas. So these are almost like chosen few sanctioned events that are taking place across the world. The second thing I've seen is that Chicago has actually embraced the chosen few. And we have, you know, the house events that take place downtown where the chosen few is kind of at the foundation of that. But then the third thing we have are these, um, the Atlanta, the, the L.A., picnics that are taking place that are not connected to the chosen few. Can you kind of give us, you know, from your perspective, how have these, you know, international events taken place and kind of what's the crew's feel about these other um, non-affiliated picnics that, that have uh, launched in other cities? Yeah, I mean, these other picnics and so forth. That's wonderful. I mean, we, we, we love it. I mean, you know, we, we don't know that they're necessarily inspired by us. We, 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 we kind of think in some cases they are. Um, but, you know, the house music, you know, it, it's all about love and support and not hate. And, and you know, we, we deeply love the guys in Atlanta that are doing house in the park. And, and we want all those things to be successful every year. So, yeah, I mean, I think we... we we take some pride in, in potentially having, you know, inspired some of these things. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to do more things around the country and around the world. I mean, we, we, we're doing a lot of club dates, and whether it's, you know, Amsterdam or Toronto or wherever it is, but um, we, we haven't really replicated picnic format in, in another city or country yet. I mean, that's, that's something that's on our plate and always been under consideration. Um, it's challenging because there's so much of local governmental, you know, red tape and right. relationships, and so so that can be can be challenging. But um, you know, to see the proliferation of, of picnics and you know, Lil Ray's Jamboree in, in New York and House in the Park in Atlanta and and, and some of the others. Um, you know, we, I guess we like to think of ourselves as the Rolls Bowl. The grand. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good, and we, we, we support the ball, and we want everybody to be, you know, successful. So let's bring it up to date. 2020, we're in a very, you know, unique situation that we've never been in before. Yeah. A lot of people like, are like, you know, what exactly is the plan for this year? So I know that it's been announced that the Chosen Few picnic will not be taking place in the celebratory 30th anniversary format, everyone together, but there are some things that I think you can share as to what we're going to do this 4th of July weekend. Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, we're, we're disappointed, but obviously it, it, it's a bigger thing going on than anybody's party or picnic, so you know, it is what it is. Um, we're going to hold off on our official 30th anniversary celebration for, for next year, um, but for this year, um, we're really excited. I mean, we're going to do a virtual chosen few, what we're calling in-house um, picnic. And um, so we're gonna, you know, obviously have DJs, we're gonna have some live performers, all of this is gonna be streamed. Um, and uh, what we're really excited about, and, and when we announced it, we, we 
started to feel the good vibe and the good energies that we're, we're going to encourage people to on that day, Saturday, July 4th, um, go out in the backyard, you know, go on the deck, go on the rooftop, pitch your tent, you know, get the grill out, right. do what you would do on Chosen Few Picnic Day. And we're going to do what we do on Chosen Few Picnic Day and try the best we can to, to try to recreate um, you know that feeling collectively without without being together. So as always, we've got some good surprises, and you know it's not just going to be DJ standing up there on a stream like you can see every day. So um, you know we're we're committed to to investing in this and, and trying to make it unique and special. But we need people to um, join us as they always do in you know, trying to recreate the feeling that day and, you know, creating a, a communal thing virtually. So with that being said, we know over the last three or four years, here comes the elephant in the room, here comes the, <laughs> here, here comes the gravy, and I got to let everybody know, I got permission beforehand because I was like, I want to take it here because I wanted to give you the form to share with us what's going on relative to the fact that now I have to get my wristband two days before I had to pay this. And if I want to do this, I got to pay that. And right. man, I remember when I used to just be able to roll up and come <laughs> in. Now it's the gate and the security guard is tripping and they said they had my name right. and they didn't have all my passes. So, you know, you mean, you mean all these things that nobody ever says about Lollapalooza or any other festival? Well, there, there it is. I, I wanted to ask my man, hey, you know, I'm coming to you and trust me. Let's give love to all of the members. We've got Kim, we've, we've got Wayne, we've got you, we've got Terry, Mike, Tony, Jesse, and Andre. I got, I got everybody, right? You got everybody. So I'm going to have everybody on in some capacity. I'm, Andre might be like, I'll do five minutes. You know, <laughs> like Vince, I, five, you got me for five. So we might have him do a cameo on Tony and, and, and Wayne's segment or something like that. But... But so, <laughs> so, but here's my point for, for bring, bringing that up is that I want you from your perspective to kind of share with people the, the, like you said, there's a lot of mechanics, there's a lot of moving parts that a lot of people aren't aware of. And as you start to fly someone in from London, as you start to provide, uh, you know, official CPD situations and security on top of that, these things are, are not free. The stages get bigger, the lights get brighter. A lot of things are happening. So I don't want to explain because I'm not sure, but I did want to give you the form to share with people what exactly has taken place with the what, what some people have called, and that's why we're here, the commercialization yeah. of the picnic. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm glad you, you're bringing that up because it's, it's something that, you know, people never get tired of talking about, although we've moved on. At, at this point, if you can't see the value in spending $25 for 12 hours of great house music DJs, live performers, uh, seeing everybody that you went to high school with, <laughs> uh, seeing your frat, seeing your sorority, Hey, being allowed to bring alcohol inside a park and, and barbecue grill and do everything you do. Uh, you know, if you can't pay 25 bucks for that, we, we have moved on from Carrie, uh, to be quite frank, because we, we, we know what, what goes into that and we, we know that the entertainment value that, that we provide. But we resisted it for a long time. Um, you know, it, it was a free event for, you know, the first 20 or so years and, uh, you know, like everything else, we weren't planning a big event and we weren't planning to try to make any money. Right. And, and to be honest with you, it's funny when I look back now, the park district was always pressing us, like, you guys should really charge. You know, you should charge for this. And we couldn't really understand why the park district was so adamant about us charging, but we came to realize when we finally did, they wanted us to make some money so they could be in our pocket. Right. So, or permit fees and, and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So, so it, it, it's a simple equation, you know? I mean, if you have a party with 100 people, you know, that's one thing. And then you have a party with 30,000 people, that's something else. And, you know, you, you can't have a party with 30,000 people without organization and security and a, a multi-thousand dollar sound system and lighting system that reaches the back of the park and 
Um, so, I mean, I, I, I could go on forever on the expenses of, of permits, you know, security, toilets, lots and lots and hundreds of toilets, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tents, um, you know, sound, lighting, caterers, you know, it, it, it goes on forever. I, you know, I don't talk about our specific finances, but one example that I always tell people is just to, to set up the fence, the little link fence that goes around the entire park, before you even think about putting anything inside the park, just the fence. The fence is about $25,000. Wow. So that's just the fence. It's about $25,000 to cover that much geography. And nonetheless, we have, you know, our good people climbing the fence and digging <laughs> under. We've had people swimming in the lagoon behind the museum. Right. And trying to, so they, they, they're still trying to get in. We're, we're industrious, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> So all of those things, and then and then then you know you got to look at the talent. You know, yeah, let's let's get uh, how much is Jocelyn Brown? How many rooms she gonna need? And how many flights from London? How much is Louis Vuitton gonna cost? How much does Joe Costello want? And, and the reality is, we're at a point where this thing is could be on automatic, and it is so established that that we could probably just not pay for expensive guests not fly in a David Morales or a Louis Vega or, and, and, and most people would be none the wiser and it'd be just fine and we'd make a lot more money, but we don't operate that way. Fair we enough. are focused on providing the best entertainment thing that we can provide. So, you know, we're never gonna do that. We're, we're, we're gonna reinvest in this event constantly um, and, and that's what we do. So I, I, I'll give you the fence example and then I will tell you, in general terms, overall, to produce the picnic in any given year, expense-wise, is hundreds, plural, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Absolutely. To, to produce the event. Absolutely. So we talked about the event going virtual, and, and I think everybody can agree that Alan broke it down in a way that it for sure shall forever be broke. <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, when, when Wayne comes on, I've got Terry coming on and, you know, Jesse will be on, uh, you know, as well. As they come on, I want everybody to have a word, but I'm sure that you kind of like set the tone now for people to have that understanding. And because things are virtual this year, uh, I wanted to kind of move into that virtual space. I want to ask you a quick question about, um, you know, the picnic this year. Are we looking at a a eight hour or 10 hour or 12 hour in-house experience yet? Or do we know exactly what the, the duration should be? Yeah, you know, I, it, it's still in planning stages. Okay. But right now we, we, we're actually thinking eight hours. We're thinking of noon to 8 p.m. Okay. And, and I should have mentioned that this event will be free. There's, there's no charge for the, the stream. Okay. Uh, we will be accepting donations um, should anybody want to do that that day um, and certainly a portion of those donations are going to go to charity Fair enough. We, we haven't figured out a specific charity but it'll probably be COVID-19 related um, things so uh, we will be taking donations and contributing to charity but tentatively I think people can plan on noon to 8pm um, some DJs, some live performers, some uh, other video stuff um, as well, some surprise guests, hopefully, and, uh, virtually and otherwise. Um, so, yeah, I think 12 to 8 is the plan right now. Uh, and uh, again, it will be, it'll be free. Again. Good deal. So now that we're in the virtual world, do me a favor and share. I mean, because a lot of people would look at Alan as a purist. I mean, you know, in, in a lot of different ways. And I say that complimentary. What led you to saying, you know what, I think I'm going to provide some entertainment in a virtual format by now doing my Saturday evening marathons? <laughs> well, I'm like, I think he's on again. I think he's still on. And why are you on again like three or four weeks ago? It was because the feed would go on and then I'm coming back and I'm like, oh, it's a new feed. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, that transition as, as well. But you have a very loyal, dedicated following and people are like, Alan's on and it's a Saturday night. You've provided a lot of emotional relief. You've provided a lot of fun in these virtual parties. But what led you... The 
the purest, to move from a physical environment, which we don't have at this time, to say, you know, I want to do something virtually, and what have been some of those challenges and some of the wins that you, yeah. you've experienced uh, going virtual? Yeah, it, 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 it's been great. I mean, obviously, you know, the times are what they are, and, you know, I didn't jump out there right away and start doing, you know, live stuff, but... Obviously, when it looked like we were going to be in this position for a minute, you know, we, we all had to think about ways to continue to do what we love and to, to reach our audience. So um, I got frustrated fairly quickly with, with Facebook, um, and, and I didn't do Instagram, but obviously Facebook and Instagram, you know, are cutting off DJ streams off, uh, oftentimes, and we, we can talk about that, or you guys talked about it last week as well. And um, so... You know, Twitch is the platform that I'm using now, and I'm using it exclusively. And, and one of the reasons I was able to use it exclusively, I mean, I, I did do a, a, a sort of a campaign on, on my Facebook page about um, I'm moving to Twitch. I really mean it. Like, if you, if you want to hear me, you, you're going to have to come over to Twitch. And, and I've been blessed, and I've been fortunate to have, have a, a fair amount of people um, come, come over there. But I'm seeing more and more DJs do that. Um, Twitch so far is not, you know, interrupting DJ sets. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing these, as you say, marathons, which I, I, I didn't plan to do that either. Um, uh, but, I, you know, I'm doing five or six hours usually every Saturday night. And, uh, you know, and, and where can I'm, they find you on Twitch? It's twitch.tv yeah, slash DJ yeah. Allen King. Exactly. Okay. Twitch.tv slash DJ Allen King. So I, I didn't necessarily plan to do like more than an hour or two, like the first time <laughs> I went on. I was like, he's still. I was like, it's twelve thirty. He started at seven. Like, <laughs> I, 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 and, and then you know, I'm, I'm seeing the numbers, like who's watching, and you know, people aren't necessarily dropping off, and I'm having a good time. And and then I came to realize that you know, this is an opportunity to go back to my roots and the roots of this genre when a Frankie or Ron Hardy was playing from midnight to the to the next morning. And I, I decided I was gonna maybe distinguish myself in, in, in doing that among the online crew. So that that was part of it. But but more than that, you know, when you're an old cat like me <laughs> and you have like six decades of music swimming around in your head. Um, you know, it's it's a rare opportunity in the in the real world, in the real club and festival world, to be able to stretch out and cover a, a wide range of <clears throat> of music. Um, I, I've been a big believer that the the microwave DJ set, as I call it, has been terrible for the house music scene. Um, I mean, what you see now is. You know, one party with six or seven DJs and everybody gets an hour or 45 minutes or even these festivals that we do, you, know, you get an hour if you're lucky. And, you know, what can you really do in an hour? You know, each person wants to shine in an hour. So, you know, you're getting up there, you're playing the hottest records, you plan that, you know, DJing for an hour is a totally different thing than DJing for five hours or six. And, you know, you can, you can pace through the night and, you know, just cover a lot of ground musically. So it's 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 worked out for me. And for whatever reason, I, I've so far had the stamina to, <laughs> to do it on Saturday nights. But, but what I've been trying to resist is, is doing it any other time during the week. So even though I'm doing that long set, I'm only doing it one night a week. So. Fair enough. And I'm probably part of the, I'll call it the third wave. You're the first wave and the Hot Mix 5 and, and Ferris and those guys, second wave, I'm third wave. Chicago, where I would be at the Baja Beach Club, let's say, you know, or somewhere on Navy Pier, and the party started at 8 and ended at 4, and there was one DJ. Or, you know, uh, a DJ will come on from 8 to 11, and then you're doing 11 to 5. You really had to format a night, and, and that was during the days... We had something that was taking place in hip hop, and I know this is not a hip hop show. It's a it's a a conversation show about music, how specifically. But there was a thing called biting in hip hop, and that meant you couldn't look like anybody else, you couldn't sound like anybody else. People couldn't do you know like Heavy D was Heavy D. You couldn't be Prince Marky D because you look like Heavy D. <laughs> and, and what we had in house music back then was it was absolutely. Um, 
you could never play the same song twice in a night. I mean, unless it was the same song, it was just like bad luck was running for right. 26 <laughs> minutes. Like it's back, it's back, it's back. And, you know, and it just, you know, it just bangs and it's a 30 yeah. minute run of one song. <laughs> but you typically, it was taboo to play the same song twice in the evening. So to be able to format a night like that, let the song breathe and do, do yeah. you know, that's my roots, third generation. You know, you were on the forefront of that. And I think it's important for people to understand that that's our mentality and where we come from. And then when you do have to do the microwave set and you're like, I got to cut this thing before the break because I've only got 20 minutes right. left. And, you know, that, that, that's not a comfortable place to be in for what it is we do. So it's incredible that you can do that on your show. Yeah, no, it, it, it's really been liberating. And, and to your point, I mean, even, even like the Daily Plaza things we do, which it was very popular, you know, chosen few and deep in Daily Plaza, but it would be one hour with, you know, four or five or six of us. <laughs> and like you say, I mean, we're, 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 we're mixing out our records way sooner than we normally would. Right. You gotta keep this thing moving for, you know, everybody have a chance to play. So there's so many things like that that the average party goer or, you know, attendee has, you know, no, no concept of. Um, so, yeah, you know, in the microwave set, maybe we're getting out of records really quickly and, and trying to play as many records as we can. And as I said, to, to be able to let records breathe and, um, you know, kind of go into different spaces is... is it's been liberating and, and fun for me, so on Saturday nights. Well, I, I started the show by saying that, you know, you are that big brother that everybody listens to, and I'll announce here for the first time, uh, I'm starting a formal campaign where I'm going to Twitch exclusively as well. I just see Thank the benefit uh, for me to give the best performance that I can give in an environment where I'm not like, am I on, am I on, am I on? And for those who haven't seen, and, and you know, this is today, the 13th, is, is that our date, the 13th of May? Uh, in, in these shelter-in-place things, a week feels like a month and a day feels like a week. So today is May 13th, 2020. So if you're watching this some years from now, uh, we're in a situation where Facebook and Instagram, they're cutting off the DJ streams and Twitch and I like what you said for the moment. Like we can't say that Twitch won't at, at, at some point, you know, at, at flip the switch on, on their end. But I think it's important for everyone who's watching this in today's time to understand that I'm going to pretty much follow my big brother. But not only that, bring an army of other listeners, an army of other viewers, because the party is not our party. It's your party. We want to give you an uninterrupted party experience. So I'll speak more about that. Uh, beyond the show, but you know, before we get into uh, Alan King, not DJ Alan King, Alan King, the family man, you know, uh, the philanthropist, the community, you know, and uh, advocate as well. Is there anything more that you would like for the audience to know, just from a music or or just from the DJ Alan King perspective, before we hop over to the personal side? No, but I, I'm going to take this opportunity to to thank you, my brother, and. You, you, you know I love you, and you're you're third generation, but you're an authentic house music DJ and an authentic house music head. But obviously, you you've um, developed a following that's much broader um, than just that, and I'm proud of you for that. But more so, you know, you, you've decided to take this broader following and, and focus this show on house music and, and make sure people understand that house music is still, you know, a current and thriving thing. It's not just some music from high, high school that, that isn't, you know, there isn't an industry for anymore. So I particularly appreciate with your reach at this point in your career, you know, taking some time to focus on house music. So I just want to thank you for that. No, I, I greatly appreciate that. And, and we'll make the capstone on, on that we started with the classic songs. Can you give us three artists, three songs, three if for that person is like, well, I don't know what this new house is or that it's yeah. still thriving. What are three contemporary, accessible, but not commercial artists yeah. or songs that you would encourage people if you want to learn more about how it's yeah. growing uh, that they should look into? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about artists or producers. Uh, I mean, we, we've certainly got two of the best in, in our camp in terms of Terry Hunter and Mike Dunn. Absolutely. That they're putting out. 
Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Louis Vega and everything that, that's coming out of Louis' camp in, in, in New York. Um, Josh Milan and Honeycomb Music. Uh, amazing artist, producer. Um, and then you've got the whole kind of Afro house um, scene as well. So there, there, there's a big subgenre. Yeah, man, you bang that joy. Joy, <laughs> joy, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> some of those artists, uh, Black Coffee, obviously, but uh, like Black Motion, um, shoot, I'm trying to think of some more that are some of my favorites, but um, in any event, um, no, I mean, you, you, you yeah, hit, the, you've hit, you've hit, you've hit. Napo, the Capo is another mm -hmm. really big, uh, Inu Napa is another producer. Too. So there's a lot of folks out there. So, you know, in, in Chicago, just locally, I mean, check out Terry Hunter, Mike Dunn, uh, Sheree Hicks. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of folks doing their thing and that, that's putting out current hot house music. Um, that's not that hard. To and Sheree is fire. <laughs> she is she's an incre incredible artist. Absolutely. Absolutely, and much love to Teresa Griffin. I mean, she's family. We, you know, she 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 created an anthem that absolutely sends the city up when yeah. people hear it. So you know, so that's, let's. That's not her, we can't leave Teresa. Uh, oh no, absolutely. We we gotta we gotta recognize T. You know. So with that being said, man, let, let's let's you know round out today's conversation and and i really thought it was important because your, your wife sophia she's the alderman of the fourth ward here in chicago you you've done a lot of incredible things not only do you have two grown women uh as, as a hashtag girl dad <laughs> uh, who are thriving and doing some incredible things you know th themselves can you just share with us you know in in your own way some of the things that you would like for us to know about alan king the father, the man, the, the advocate, and, and also the lawyer. Uh, I don't know, the lawyer stuff is boring, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean, my family is, is most important to me, and, and, and I'm a big family guy. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of my wife, who i um, very late in life for doing something like this, uh, kind of stumbled her way into politics, and you know, she really wasn't looking to, to run for alderman or, or be anything like that, but um, there was an opening that came up and, and a few of her girlfriends convinced her that like, you, you do realize that you're basically already the alderman, you know, you volunteer for this, you do that, you do, you might as well just get the gig officially and get paid for it, um, which I'm actually thankful she is getting paid for. <laughs> um, but, you know, she she had no desires or goals per se to, um, you know, get into politics. So I, I, I respect her and support her. And, and because she's not, you know, has no agenda, or is not looking for a stepping stone to a higher office or anything, she's, she's focused on, you know, quite frankly, the African-American community and what impact she can make on the African-American community um, in the city council. So she's rocking and rolling. Uh, my oldest daughter was a professional dancer, but she's going back to school. So she was dancing with a couple of companies, uh, one in Dallas and, and, and one here. Um, she's going back to school for uh, physical therapy now. And my youngest daughter is at Vogue magazine in New York. So she's wow. um, writing for Vogue and DJing as well. And hopefully upstairs listening to me now because I'm, we're so happy we got her out in New York, you know, with the crazy yeah, absolutely. Thing that's going on in New York. So, um, you know, I, I've been involved in, in a lot of things. I'm, I'm, I'm chairman of a board now, uh, Children First Fund, which is actually the sort of the charitable arm of Chicago Public Schools. So we kind of raise money for CPS and, and manage grants and um, to support the vision of, of, of Dr. Janice Jackson and, and, and the CPS regime. So um, I kind of see that as my way of giving back to the city. And, uh, you know, I started at least in Chicago Public Schools. So uh, that and some other boards. Um, I, I do want to mention, and, and I only hesitate to mention it because we've got to like, get off our butts and execute on all the plans that we have. But the Chosen Few DJs have a foundation, 501c3 foundation, wow. called the Beyond the Groove 
uh, fund uh, that be, the Beyond the Goo Foundation. So our plan is to use that as a vehicle to work with young people on you know, DJing and, and music production and you know, sound engineering, everything that has anything to do with with music and, and parties. Uh, and music. Uh, so we, 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 we are in the early stages of kind of putting that together and figuring out exactly what that will look like. Um, but it's really driven by two things. I mean, we, we had this amazing upbringing in Chicago, all of us, and we had safe spaces to go to, to, to party all night. And, you know, these kids just don't, don't have that anymore. And exactly. And we're also looking at it as sort of part of the part of an anti-violence solution to, to help these kids have some constructive things to do after school. And, you know, there's some other folks that are out there doing it now, and, and I tip my hat to them as well. Um, but we're going we're gonna to make a splash in, in that space um, real soon, and, you know, we're really excited about just giving back to young people here in Chicago. No, that's powerful. Man, I'm, I'm definitely honored to have you here. Uh, I'm, it's absolutely been a fun, um, you know, interactive experience, uh, hopefully for the people that have been watching right now. But this is history. That That's something that's, uh, that I'll let you know. I say, Alan, we're going to, you know, take our time just like it was a hot cut. Let it breathe. There's no reason for us to rush because these are the stories. This is the reason I wanted to create the voices of house music. There's so many of your fans, so many people that are dedicated to your sound, your spirit, that have never really heard your story or understand, you know, more the inner workings of how things go with, you know, certain things that are going on with the, the chosen few. So this is really a time capsule moment. This is going to go in the annals of, of of history as it relates to Chicago house music and so many other things. So as a, I guess you could say the, um, the, the, uh, you know, the, the period at the end of the sentence, a question that I have for you that we can round out with is for the culture of house music. What's the one progressive thing that you would like to see from either the people that are providing the entertainment or you can take the angle of the people that are receiving what is being presented. So either the provider or the recipient, yeah. what would you like to see progress the culture? Uh, I, I'll address it to the providers. I mean, the, the DJs in particular. Um, I, I don't always understand it and I don't always understand what they're talking about and I don't understand the specific beef but Lord have mercy our Chicago DJs on social media beefing and bitching and um, you know there always seems to be some beef or somebody trying to put somebody else down or take their shine away and those people are missing what house music and house music culture is about. Now, don't get me wrong. We've always had our, our, our people that, that were a little bit nefarious. <laughs> but, um, you know, house music is about supporting each other and love. And, you know, it sounds trite, but love and, and peace and positivity. It, it, it's the reason that we can put 40,000 black people in a park on the south side of Chicago, for, you know, without a single act of violence or a, a, a single, you know, meaningful incident of any kind in terms of crime. I mean, if you want to be part of this and you, and you really get it, you, you're not beefing about DJ such and such. And, you know, did you hear, you know, he actually played this. And so I, I get it from the standpoint that a lot of people are frustrated because there's a lot of DJs and there's not enough venues for them to play. And there are not enough opportunities to be heard. Although this moment is, is, is changing that a little bit. I mean, the, the, the ground is being leveled and everybody can go on, on, on live. Everybody doesn't need to go on live. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as, as, I, as I'm making this point, I make that quick. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, I'm going I'm to help you clean it up shortly. I'm going to no, help. No, no, I'm going to help. It's fine because I, 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 I you know, it's just a joke, and I don't mean it toward you. Absolutely. But, 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 we have got to stop this, just beefing. And you know, you, you're, you're not going to get 
picked to play this festival. And you're not going to be hired to play this club if you have a, an attitude that is constantly negative, constantly you know detrimental to what's going on. Be happy for everybody that's doing something positive in this scene, and then your time will come. I mean, that, that's the way it should work. So, you know, people are, 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 are party attendees, our, our bands in other cities, our club owners, our festival producers, our everything, you know, everybody is watching all this stuff play out all the time. Right. And it's just not a good look and it, it, it needs to, you know. Well, uh, and here's what I meant by, I'm gonna help you clean it up. A lot of people would not know about the quality of our personal relationship. They would see us as opposite right. ends of the spectrum right. uh, for for Chicago. Like, this guy says nothing. <laughs> this guy says a, a lot. This guy lets the song play. This guy right. may or may not. And, you know, it, it's it's always situation appropriate. I mean, that to me, you know, just to share personally, I mean, that's w what I'm excited about as a chameleon. Like, you know, I've, I've worked with house uh, pro uh, uh, promoters who have brought me in for an event, and they're like, you killed that. I'm like, I don't play for a right. traditional house crowd the way I do for the birthday crowd. Like, it's, you know, I'm going to put on the right hat for the right situation. And to that extent, uh, I just wanted to share that you are actually practicing what you preach because not to, to disparage anyone else, but you actually have said, hey, you know what? I think I might not necessarily be the best fit for that event, but call Vince Adams. And people have said, hey, Alan King said that, and, you know, relative to what they needed for that thing. And, and I've absolutely carried that myself in past events that I said, hey, it's a, a what, a 25-year-old party? I'm not the guy for that. You may want to call this guy. And, you know, so I, I do want to share, and that's something that, you know, I wasn't going to say, but just relative to what you're saying, you absolutely walk the walk in that regard. I, I appreciate you taking me under your wing, you know, in spirit, um, and now virtually as well as being a voice of house music, my brother. And I thank you so much. I thank your family for allowing us to steal this time away from you as well. And I really appreciate the mark that you've left not on the city but on the character uh, of DJing and you brought so much to the table it's great to be able to have you shine and share your story my man uh, I appreciate you man like I said love you brother and I wouldn't be sending folks to Vince Adams if I didn't think he was a fantastic DJ I, I appreciate that, no thank, that. <laughs> th th thank you so much and family, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and make it a wrap. Like I said, I've got some great, great, great announcements that are coming in a very short amount of time as it relates to things that you're going to hear about the voices of house music. You're going to be able to hear Alan not only in this live format, but we've got some great, great news coming your way this Friday. And the other announcement is I'm going live exclusively now on Twitch, and I'm starting a 10 days to Twitch campaign, not for myself, but for every party attendee, for you to sign up on Twitch. Why is that? Because you need an uninterrupted party experience, and we're going to have a lot of great DJs on that platform that can, provide, that can provide that for you. So with that being said, my name is DJ Vince Adams. This is the Voices of House Music. I'm so excited that I had Alan, and next week's guest is the top celebrity househead in the entire world. That's my brother, the one and only Dion Cole. Dion Cole, that's right, comedian and actor Dion Cole will be my guest. We're going to have a good time, and I've got a special surprise for Dion, so you don't want to miss that on the third edition or the third episode of the Voices of House Music. Thank you so much, family, for coming out. It's been an incredible 90 minutes with the history of house. And with that being said, everybody have an incredible time. We'll see you at the next episode.